to boldly go where no radio program has gone before. It's El Kent's Movie Club. It's El Kent's Movie Club. It's El Kent's Movie Club. I like how you do harmony with yourself. It's pretty talented, man. Yeah. And the fact that I remembered which way I went in the register, too. You know, when you hit that real high note at the end and I went down instead of up. Uh huh. Yeah, all of that. Kent Wolgamont joins us from the Lincoln Journal Star. How you doing, Kent? I'm doing I'm well. Doing well man. How, are how are you? Good. Doing good, especially after what was an extremely long week. You know, before we get into um, our movie, Life of Brian, which we had to call an audible, by the way, if you were with us last week, yeah. unfortunately, Mystic River, which is a movie I picked originally, disappeared off Netflix. Um, on Monday, literally on, on Monday, Monday, June first. Yeah. So yeah, we called an audible a couple days ago to Monty Python's The Life of Brian. But Kent, you wrote today in the Journal Star about protest music, and uh, you know, obviously, we're in a time of great turmoil as we were back in the '60s when the protest movement and and the music of the protest movement was such a, a huge part of of that era. Um, I thought it was a really interesting read because. And I guess the question I had was, we consume music in such different ways now than we did back in the 60s. I wonder if I wonder how influential protest music of police violence, of of, you know, black uh, persecution, how that is, how how that's going to be received because of the way we get music today versus how we used to get it back in the day where we relied a lot on the radio to hear some of these songs. Well, I think what you won't see is a giant anthem that covers everybody, which is kind of what happened in the 60s. Although some of the stuff, let me let me be very specific on one song, like the um, uh, Buffalo Springfield, the Stop Hey, What's That Sound? That was actually written not about the racial strife and the riot. It was written about riots on Sunset Strip that happened in like 66 and it kind of got repurposed. And so a lot of those kind of 60s songs still have some relevance today. If you look at like Sly Stones, there's a riot going on, stuff like that. But there are also songs that are coming out now where let's say Low Cut Connie, which is a rock and roll band from Philadelphia, has a song that's called Look What They've Done that came out in February. He, they have one audience. That's one audience. Mm -hmm. Today, actually not today. Yesterday, maybe. Um, Run the Jewels surprise released uh, an album, and it is very much uh, ha has several songs that, and they hit a sort of market that's like almost alternative hip hop. They're not hardcore seen as the hardcore hip hop. And then today there's a guy, uh, a rapper, uh, YG, uh, released a song, uh, FTP, and I can't say the rest of the title mm -hmm. on, <laughs> on your radio program <laughs> unless you want to find. So <laughs> that will hit a different audience. So I think that's, if, if, it, if it hits, I think that's how it'll hit. And maybe one of them will catch on with like the protesters. But as far as a wide societal thing, I think it'll be very much like the rest of the way we listen to music, which is very segmented now. Kent, one more kind of along these lines before we get to Life of Brian. How, what will this mean for the movie industry? Like we're already, of course, in a really weird spot because of COVID-19 and, and production being halted around the world. Do, do you think... Like, I guess, what did the 60s and, and the civil rights movement do for movies that maybe we could see in a different way in, in our modern era now? I think that process was kind of already in progress um, after, what was it, two years ago, three years ago, Oscars So White, where yeah. there were no, yeah. no uh, black virtually no black nominees, Correct. et cetera. And 
I think you'll see more films that are, and that's changed already. Uh, you know, you it's in the production line where you where you got a movie like Hidden Figures about the women that were part of the uh, uh, space program uh, that came out last summer had Janelle Monet and and what Olivia Davis maybe in it. And you'll see some of that. I also think you'll see how would you say it more topical Spike Lee type movies, right? I mean, if you think of Do the Right Thing, kind of addresses this exact situation, and that was 30 years ago. Yeah. I think yeah. you'll see films of that, in that sense, also try to make some, you know, address this in some way. Although what happens is you've got a year and a half, essentially, between now. If they start making it now, it can't come out until – at least this time next year, if it's a major feature, and it's usually closer to a year and a half. So by then, that might feel dated. You know, who knows? Sure. But, but it'll be it'll be going on. I got to imagine the documentary. Uh, the documentary oh, yeah. that will come out of this will yeah. also be very very interesting, and with yeah. more places to share them, like streaming media. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. And faster. You can get a doc yeah. done a lot faster than a feature film. Because for many reasons, but in part because you don't have so many hands in the fire. You know, the documentary filmmaker can kind of make the movie, you know, buy whatever music they need to have a score and be done with it where you don't have to have, go through the whole studio hoops to make a fictional film. Well, now to the movie this week, and it is, as I mentioned, Monty Python's The Life of Brian. And um, now talk about things that were controversial, especially in 1979 <laughs> yeah. when this movie came out. There were a lot of theaters, especially in the Bible Belt in the South, in this country, that refused to show it. And if you've ever seen, and I, there's, there's, a, there's a couple of Monty Python documentaries out there. Uh, there's one that was streaming on Netflix recently where they go back and they replay a lot of the interviews that the cast members had, the Python troupe had with the media and having debates over, you know, whether this film was uh, a heresy or whether it was blasphemy. And there was some really, really fascinating stuff there. But this is a pretty, for its time, especially a pretty biting satire on religion, on organized religion. And and it, it of course, stars the cast of, of Monty Python as Brian a guy who gets mistaken <laughs> for the Messiah and it, it, and the hilarity ensues. Absolutely. The, what I think we should do here is you guys, if you haven't seen it or hadn't seen it in a while, I want to hear what you said. And the reason for that is I have had the opportunity over the years to talk to three of the Pythons at oh. pretty good length including Graham Chapman, who is the one who played Brian. And, and was the first so, to pass away, too. What's that? And, yeah. and the, first, the first of the troop that had passed I, away. Yes. Yep. Many years ago. So why don't you guys talk about it a little bit, about what you thought, and then I'll add some stuff in, because I can't really come at it from, I just watched this movie again because I've seen it so many times, in part because I've written about those guys so much. So this was the Kent the first time I'd ever seen it, and I'm pretty sure the the only other Monty Python movie that I've seen. What's the flesh wound one? I always forget the name. Holy, of the Holy Grail. Holy Grail. That's the, I'm pretty sure that's the only one I'd ever seen. So I knew the kind of sense of humor I was walking into when I when I sat down to watch it last night. It did take me a little bit to kind of get into the rhythms because it it in a way it feels plotless early where it's just like here's another ridiculous thing, here's another ridiculous thing, here's another ridiculous thing. But I, I felt like once I got into the rhythm of it. I, I, I mean, I laughed at, at, a, at a majority of it, and it made me really, especially now as we've begun this conversation, I think I would love it a whole lot more the next time I watch it, which I plan on doing at some point in time. Um, I, I just, it, it's so ridiculous, and, and, and I don't want to ask you the questions just yet, I guess, because we'll, we'll go around. Oh, no, and, go ahead. You can ask that. Okay. I just Could a movie like this be made today, not in terms of satire, but just... It, in the way it's just so ridiculous and in, in how it's funny, it like Airplane, you know, I love Airplane, but it almost seems like we don't see comedies like that anymore. And I don't really know why. 
these are what I call uh, sketch comedies. Sure. Each of those little passages could stand by themselves. And that comes out of the Python TV show. You right. know, if you go back and watch the TV shows, they were sketches and they, this is stringing a bunch of the sketches together into kind of a narrative, right? Mm -hmm. Right? And nobody does that kind of comedy anymore. No. Outside of maybe Saturday Night Live, and they don't do it that well, right? Mm -hmm. But if, you know, the airplane movies, that airplane movie was the exact same thing. But the Pythons were the masters of this. They'd done, what, six, seven, eight years of TV before this movie came out. I don't remember exactly when they started TV, but it was sometime in the late 60s. Yeah. Stibbs, what did you think? I I knew I had I, I thought I had seen it in the past, and I think it was a situation where a lot of the last half of the movie I recognized and didn't remember anything from the beginning. So I think friends would have it on. Okay. I know a specific family that I knew liked it and watched it, and I would like come in midway through and 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 the good thing, like Kent said, is because all these things kind of stand alone, I remembered it and thinking like, oh, that was funny and that was funny and that was funny and didn't really grasp the entire story. Then you don't really have to because you get the idea scene by scene. Um, I didn't love it. I thought I'd like it more being older and seeing it again, and I think I liked it less. Hmm. I don't know why. I Part of it could have just been the headspace I was in. I also, it was super late last night by the time I finally got to watch oh. it because I was out at my family's house. I laughed like once. Oh, wow. Really? Real early on. Oh, wow. Now, looking back, I think about the scenes and I, the, the, at, like the, the idea of the, the scenes. idea of the scenes, like one in particular I'm thinking of is somewhat early on when he's selling, um, selling concessions, concessions, and they're, and they're, and they're the, arguing about the, about who they are. Yeah. <laughs> like, no, the we're the Judean people up front. No, no, we're the front. The right. front people that was funny. Front. Yeah. What about now Andrew? looking back, but when it's happening, I was just kind of absorbing it. Like yeah. I wasn't laughing at it. Yeah. Um, the one thing I did laugh at was like real, like the very beginning, essentially, um, when they're when they're st when Brian and his mom are standing way in the back when Jesus is talking and you know giving a sermon. Yeah. And right after that, when people are walking away, there's like four guys walking out, and they're like, "Do you believe that guy? Like the meek are the problem. Blessed are the meek. What is he talking about? Like <laughs> that made me laugh because yeah. it's it's also very yeah, it fit today. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> it is. It um, is rather. Timely. But I don't know. It, it seemed. And, and it is kind of slapsticky and spoofy. It seemed very elementary. Um, the comedy that is like the whole, I think you can say it because it's spelled a certain way. The whole biggest dickest thing. Ah. Like, I didn't laugh at that at all. I was like, like the first time they say it, like the whole chuckle thing is funny. And then they just say it 74 more times. And I'm like, all right, yeah, I get yeah. it. I yeah. get it. I get it. I don't know. I didn't love it, but I've never been a huge Monty Python person in general. It is, well, that, it is a was comedy. Exactly what I was going to say. Yeah, that, that's Python that you yep. you found, and boy, if you don't like them, you're not going to find this movie funny yeah. at all, right? I mean, that's just the way it it works. It's the same with the uh, Holy Grail, and it's important to note this movie came after Holy Grail. Holy Grail, and what happened? was Holy Grail was a huge hit unexpectedly. And they were like, you guys should make another movie. Mm -hmm. And then they decided to do this and <laughs> may have bitten off a little more than they should have. Uh, the original financer for it was EMI Films out of, uh, which is EMI no longer exists as an independent company, but was an English company, and they pulled the plug on it the day before con uh, production was supposed to start. And so George Harrison gave them $3 million to make the movie. So awesome. And, and one of the... I, he was a huge I, fan. Don't, I, I don't remember who it was, said it's the most expensive movie ticket ever. Yeah, I think it was <laughs> Michael Palin said that. Because, gave him because he wanted to see the movie, so... It's the most expensive movie ticket in the history. And by the way, George Harrison has a very brief cameo. It's at the very beginning. It's in that scene at the Sermon in the Mount. Oh, is it? Um, where he says something, but but they had to overdub his voice, 
for some reason because ah, it wasn't my it favorite was, Beatle, George yeah. Harrison. But yeah, um, so if you watch it, watch for that there. And I will say this to the part of the controversy, the way even though it's talking about religion, the spoof is of the organization yes. of religion and the nature of followers. Yes. It does not spoof Jesus or Christianity itself. Correct. And if you look at the way Jesus is treated in this, you only see him twice. Once at the very beginning in the manger scene, when they first confuse Brian and then the three wise men come in and grab all the gifts, take it away from Brian's mom and go down the street to the actual manger. And then in the sermon where there's there, all the jokes are basically, you know, because the people are standing way in the back and they're talking about the big nose guy. And then, you know, it's all humor based on the fact that they're standing so far back they can't, can't hear. hear. Him. So that's where you get the line. Blessed are the cheese makers mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, because, you know, they couldn't understand what he was saying. But but the the actual the tenets of religion aren't insulted here as much as. The followers, for example, the scene where the followers really start to gather around Brian, he drops his sandal that and the people great. grab the sandal and pick it up. Hold it up. up. Yeah. <laughs> he, he gives he had some gourd in his hand because he was trying to buy something and he hands it off to this woman and the woman says, no, the gourd is the symbol. And so you have people following the people with the shoe and the people following the people with the gourd and they're all following Brian and it's all just ridiculous. That part but, was good. Yeah. Now, again, and then to 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 drive my point home is like, I laughed at that. Like the whole, everything he said, even though it was just a plain fact, they'd be yeah. like, Oh my gosh, it's a miracle. Or yeah. like, why don't you guys go try eating some of that berries on that bush? Oh my God, it's a miracle. That's funny. And then when there's the whole crowd is standing outside his window and the it, joke the where scene, they're, it just lasts too long. It's way too, they just yeah. drive it into the ground. of like, yes, we think that oh, that's funny I, once or twice. And then they do it. 12 times it goes back to what kent said it's a sketch it's sketch comedy and it it, it just is spread out and mm -hmm. so that's why i thought there was some stuff that was nice and tight that was really funny and then that bit that it, it was funny at the start and then I, i'm thinking like wow this is almost 10 minutes it seems yeah, of people yelling and repeating Real quick, <laughs> i wanted to add this I, I i don't i haven't really studied a whole lot of history of that time period in in the world i wonder how much of that is like based in fact how everyone you know how we were always looking for the next michael jordan how many people were looking for the next, you know, Messiah, like all the time, just looking for those types of signs back in, you know, mm -hmm. year zero. I, I, I he said it was going to rain tomorrow and it did. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, um, I guess I, the two or three things here, they deliberately made sure that they didn't satirize Jesus and the quotes that I've seen and that I actually got from Graham Chapman is like, he was a really good guy, and all the things he said are good. You can't be out there making fun of that, right? Yeah. Right, so yeah. That's why they set it up the way they did. And then the other thing that they talked about, uh, I've talked to Terry Gilliam, Graham Chapman, and Michael Palin are the ones I've talked to. And mostly the Life of Brian stuff I talked with Graham Chapman, they filmed this thing in Tunisia, on the set, using the same sets from the movie Jesus of Nazareth. Oh, my goodness. And then Terry Gilliam, who was the art director of the bunch of them, went back in and redid those sets, essentially, uh, for the look for this movie. He also did the uh, intro, uh, the graphic intro. I and thought that was really cool. I will and say then yes. that's always a thing that they've they've done throughout their co their series. Is, Very you know, creative. The way they open their shows, the, the animations are are yeah. a big part of Python. And and that's Terry Gilliam, and he's the only American Python, by the way. He's okay. from St. Louis. Um, and then the scene where uh, Brian falls into the off the tower and lands inside the spaceship, <laughs> right? That's Terry that. Gilliam. I and hate that. Interestingly. <laughs> was done entirely in the camera. That was not any kind of set animation or anything. And for 1970, whatever, it was very forward looking bit of animation. And I bring up Terry Gilliam because of what you were saying about the editing of the film and how it was put together. Life of Brian was directed by uh, Gilliam and Terry Jones. This movie 
they booted Gilliam out of the direction, and it's Terry Jones. And Gilliam to this day, uh, or at least to 15, 10 years ago or whatever, the last time I talked to him, is still irritated about that and specifically about things like what you're talking about, saying it could have been tightened up and made funnier and yada, yada, yada. So mm-hmm. you hit right on something that's a disagreement with them. The other interesting fact I think that I should pass along about this is Graham Chapman was a horrid alcoholic. I mean, Ooh. of the worst order. In fact, the reason that I ended up talking to him is he came to the university um I think it was sometime in the early 80s to speak about alcoholism, substance abuse, and the story and that kind of thing. And he he wanted to play Brian so badly he quit drinking. Mm. Wow. 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 That's crazy. Yeah. Dedication, though. Yeah, certainly. Too. And I think it, I mean it, it 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 just it worked. I loved it. I mean, but I'm a Python guy, so I really I really love it. Now, it's not my favorite. Holy Grail is still my favorite because I laugh out loud still to this day at a lot of the the shtick there. But I like this. This movie is a little different in that it's it's more satirical mm-hmm. than than um, than than um, Holy Grail. Holy is. Grail is. And and there's some humor that kind of makes you think. And then anytime you can get any of the cast members to mimic women. I love the voice that they use they all use the same high-pitched shrieking voice the stoning scene was, was women, one yes. of my favorite scenes that was that good. was a really good anytime scene. they they do you know and if you've ever seen the the series the television series when they do the um the the gang of grannies that wow. yeah that basically acts like hell's angels and they just beat the crap out of people <laughs> it's one of the funnier skits that they've ever done pretty hilarious yeah yeah and and if you're a python fan you know that might this this film was their last one, essentially, and they did do the meaning of life, which is about three or four years later. Right, but that was kind of more assembled, I think. You yeah, say, and wasn't like a narrative film like this. And I think they figured out we're gonna we're best at the sketch and not at trying to put together a whole bunch of quote unquote narrative movies. Mm-hmm. So I, and that was the point I wanted to make. So if mm-hmm. you watch The Meaning of Life, it's kind of much more episodic, I guess you would say. And but I love Python as well. So, you know, that was uh that was fun to have an excuse to watch it again. Absolutely. All right, well let's get to the main event. It's time for Stibbs to choose oh, the boy. next movie. Here we go. We have had what did we have? Platform? We had Platform, we had Horse Girl, and we had... <laughs> that stupid That's Florida it? movie. Florida, oh, Florida, Florida, Florida Project. depressing Florida, All right, so Florida we have had some movies. Florida kids. Here we go. Pick number four this for Stibbs. This one Stimps. is not really along the same lines. I'm not going for the shock value here. This is okay. another one I've seen, but I haven't seen it in a long time. And I don't think it's one that's widely known, even though you're going to recognize a lot of people in it. Kent, have you ever seen the movie Bernie with Jack Black? Yes. The funeral director? Yes. I want to watch that one. And is it available on? It is It is on Amazon Prime, but I also looked it up, too. You can watch the whole thing for free on YouTube in, oh, a- in HD. Oh. So, you, yeah, and no one should have an issue with that. Pull up the YouTube app on your smart TV or yeah, Xbox I, I, or Amazon Fire. I just and, clicked the link. There it is. Yep, yeah. I scrolled through it and everything. It's all there. Awesome. It's based on a true story of this kind of goofy, super nice single man in the community and this crazy story and path that he went on eventually it's oh well you know what stibs it's different it's weird it's 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 an offbeat dark comedy um so it's still in my wheelhouse but okay. it's not it's not i'm not going for the shock value of trying to piss off john here. <laughs> we'll do that in i think john weeks. will actually like it I really all right do. all right, all right. And jack black is one of my favorites this is one of my favorite roles for him. I won't sit here and review it. We'll do that next week. But I, I thought he was awesome in this movie. I'm All excited right. for you guys to see Last it. summer, he played uh, with Tenacious D. They played a Pinewood Bowl here in Lincoln. That's right. And packed the place. I think it's the biggest crowd they've ever had at Pinewood. Was oh, really? Wow. 
They're great. They're I've funny. been out to Pinewood when it's packed. It's uh, there. There, there might still be people trying to get home from that show. <laughs> <laughs> it is if not fun ever, to get in and out of been to, uh, <laughs> Pinewood Bowl. Well, Kent, this was fun as always, and uh, appreciate it. And uh, and thanks for being uh, accommodating to us because I know you got some uh, other things you got to do today. Uh, well, this is my uh, that this might help people to understand why we're bouncing around. I have the Friday afternoon. Um, you have to be available to do stuff shift mm -hmm. at the and I am doing the mayor's press conference at three thirty. Hence, no four o'clock. Mm -hmm. So that that's how mm -hmm. that works. And uh, you did see the big news of the week. However, the NBA is back, baby. Woo! <laughs> Let's go, kids. Can't wait to talk about that with you in two months. Yeah, in two months. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Kent, we'll have a great rest of your day and, a, and an awesome weekend. And we'll talk to you next week about Bernie. And that's not about any political candidates, by the way. I just <laughs> right. don't want to trigger anybody. This is not a Democratic <laughs> documentary. No. Uh, no. Take care, Kent. Thanks. Thank you, Kent. You. Kent, Kent Wolgamont. And there it is, our review of the life of Brian. Good stuff. Mm -hmm. Always fun segment with Kent in the movie club. All right, got to take a break. You'll be back. We have more of Unsportsmanlike Conduct. Chris Baznet will join us. We'll be back in the stream. We'll have a different link, but we'll be back in the stream on the video side in about 30 minutes or so. So you can tune back in for that. But always, wherever you're listening or watching, remember, we're always on the radio. 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 1620, The Zone. Bye, YouTube.